when I was in the army, we would conduct field training exercises. We'd practice reacting to ambush or rehearse squad attack. And I don't think there was ever an after action review where communication wasn't brought up. On the field of operations, be it Iraq or Chicago, communication is vital to an operator's success. It can be the simple things like a police officer effectively communicating his location over the air so that assistance can arrive promptly. It can be things like making sure all your Joes know the proper sign and countersign so as to avoid friendly fire. But it can also be much larger than that. This tale you're about to hear is about how communication, a man with a radio effectively reporting back his observations, literally won the war in the Pacific during World War II. This is the story of the Coast Watchers. I was always fascinated by these men who were first introduced to me in the video game Medal of Honor Rising Sun. I remember seeing the Martin Clemens in the video game, famous Coast Watcher, with his fancy Australian-style hat and the natives with him. Really, really inspired me. They were men isolated behind enemy lines, working with the locals to report back the movements of Japanese forces over the radio. It was a dangerous mission, and it was a privilege for me to sit with the last living Coast Watcher, Jim Burroughs, to hear his story. First of all, thank you for coming on and, and being willing to be interviewed. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and I guess we'll just open it up with uh, who were the Coast Watchers? What was their mission? And how did they sort of get their start in World War II? Okay, Paul. Well, uh, thanks very much for your invitation to uh, uh, hear what I have to say uh, as a result of the website, um, which is... Uh, Set, set out in, in my whole story. But um, just on, the, on that question, uh, way back uh, when the war started on September 3rd, 1939, the Second World War, that is, um, uh, a naval um, ad admiral decided to um, uh, seek around uh, the various uh, islands. He was a uh, expat anyway, and he... Uh, tapped in on um, observers, directors, uh, plantation owners, managers, you name it, teachers, and he gave them uh, a TV set and he taught them Morse code. Now, uh, that was to create a uh, communication uh, unit, but um, for two years uh, it lay very silent, uh, uh, dormant, because Obviously, um, the war was being uh, undertaken in Europe, and it was only uh, in uh, December uh, 40, 41, that's two and a half years later, that um, that uh, the Coast Watchers came in, in to be, become operational, which they did uh, did immediately. In fact, um, a couple of Coast Watchers even warned of the oncoming Japanese fleet uh, down to KVN and and uh, and rebel to uh, to uh, invade and and occupy them which they duly duly did so that um, it was uh, formed uh, under G general Douglas's uh, requirement uh, to form allied intelligence intelligence bureau and the Coast Watchers became uh, part of uh, M Special Unit, which was one half of the AIB, and the other half was Z Special. Uh, and there's been a lot of publicity about the Z Special. Um, they did some spectacular stuff, but uh, they later on tried to do it again and it was a miserable failure. On the other hand, the Coast Watchers M Special um, had a hell of a lot to do with actually saving the Pacific Pacific War, which I'll probably touch on touch on later. So um, the government, in its wisdom, the Australian government, had set up a uh, what was called the Bird Forces in in a Malay barrier to uh, protect Australia from any threat from the north. Now. Surprisingly enough, this was done in um, mid-1941, that is uh, six months before Pearl Harbor. But um, 
in doing so, they sent uh, a contingent to to rebel in, in KBN of uh, 1,500 uh, personnel. Uh, and bearing in mind they were going to be just defensive uh, if anything happened. And as I reiterate, it was six months before Pearl Harbor. So um, that was the uh, whole uh, uh, idea of the Coast Watchers. There is one very important dis difference with them. Their strict mandate was not to get caught. Uh, they actually uh, adopted a, a, a theme of Ferdinand the Bull sitting under the trees reporting because obviously if you're caught, um, you can't carry out your duties of reporting on enemy enemy movements, which they du duly, duly did. As it turned out, of about 400 Coast Watchers, um, 38 of them were caught, uh, tortured, uh, one decap decapitated, and um, so obviously uh, they weren't able to, to do their, carry out their work. I, I uh, personally got involved, um, I had two brothers, uh, an elder brother, Robert, uh, was, uh, was um, in the uh, uh, Royal Australian Engineers, and he was one of the troops set up in uh, mid mid forty one, and uh, uh, later just as quickly he was uh, one of the prisoners caught by the Japs when they landed, and he was one of the uh, one thousand and fifty three uh, captives that were sent to um, uh, uh, to uh, Hokkaido in a prison ship but it was sunk by an American submarine. Uh, I had a twin brother, Tom, who was also in the Air Force uh, because he'd been called up as a, as a cadet. Unfortunately, he went down on a plane in the Beaufort bomber in, in December of 43. So um, of the band of three brothers who were, uh, all had their destiny in rebel, I'm the only one who came home. Um, because uh, the, the two brothers were in, in uh, were already up there, my parents wouldn't assign my uh, my uh, authority to join the army. But when I was turned 18, uh, uh, they couldn't stop me, so I quickly joined. And I spent six six weeks learning Morse code. I spent one and a half years learning Morse code on the Malayan headquarters to to uh, Moresby when the Japs were nearly down in, into into Moresby. And then um, well, they asked for six volunteers and I could, couldn't put my hand. Uh, there's an old adage in the army, you'd never volunteer for anything, but I couldn't put my hand up quick enough to cook with the brothers up there. So um, I joined this secretive, very dangerous uh, mob called the Advanced Management uh, uh, Amphibious Force, which was owned by the actual uh, US Navy. And in fact, for, for nine months, I was in the US Navy with my address, San Francisco, but I was up, up north. When, when, uh, when they disbanded uh, in 43, I immediately switched to become a coach watcher. So that's a long-winded uh, story to get so back we're... to the point of uh, where I came into it. So uh, not, to, not to cut you off, but just to understand, so that first uh, assignment was actually you were attached to the U.S. military at that time? Yes, it was the U.S. Uh, Seventh Fleet, the, the Navy. And uh, what we did, uh, we, we had joined up with expat coast watchers that had been seconded to the uh, US Navy. And um, I spent uh, nine months uh, up and down on a lovely PT boat. Boy, oh boy, were they uh, <laughs> get about boat to in 60 k's an hour or something, uh, landing on various uh, islands, including New Guinea to New Britain, 
uh, just to suss out uh, the uh, existence or otherwise of Japanese. And more importantly, uh, to find out um, where, uh, where the allegiances of the lovely natives uh, that uh, uh, did so much in, in uh, helping the war, war effort. Because while the natives were under Japanese uh, occupation uh, before, because of fear and mal maltreatment, they were belatedly uh, uh, on, the, on the Japanese si side. Uh, whereas uh, with, with the Australians and Americans who uh, worked, worked with them, they uh, they were uh, okay. But one of our parties got caught by the Japs when the uh, natives, just to illustrate the point, um, were now landing into Hollandia to suss out the, uh, the US uh, aims to uh, invade or reinvade and re recapture but the natives actually gave up the uh, the party that uh, was left on the beach to the japs and uh, the japs captured them and killed half of them and uh, uh, so that was just an illustration of the importance of knowing where the allegiances of natives lay right right but I've also heard sort of like a, on a flip side, too, that uh, some allied pilots would talk about how, you know, if they were shot down, you know, they knew some of the islanders were probably on their side rather than the Japanese side. And they knew Coast Watchers would probably get to them and help them out. No. Yes. Um, on that very point, uh, uh, I'm not kidding, but there are over hundreds of U.S. Air Force uh, people shot down on the various islands of, uh, of the, uh, the, the whole area, down from New Ireland, New Britain, uh, down through uh, to, to, to Guada, Guadalcanal. And there's one particular case where um, a, uh, one of the guys in the P-38, and I've done a separate uh, uh, story on that in my website, um, which which would be of interest because it was an interview where he was uh, uh, landed in in the bush on his, on his own, and for uh, about a month he lived off grubs and snails and heaven knows what. Eventually picked up by some uh, uh, helpful uh, natives, uh, and one of them uh, it was a breastfeeder. Uh, actually fed him uh, to keep, keep him alive. And then they delivered him to uh, one of the coast watching parties who then uh, repatriated him uh, out. So um, the, there were certainly uh, cases where the, uh, the wonderful natives were uh, so helpful. In fact, without the natives, there wouldn't have been any coast watchers because they they uh, in the, in each party, one of the components, apart from a radio operator, of which I was one, um, they had the repat leader, but they also had the natives because uh, they knocked up uh, by palms and what have you, a sort of hut and the, the camp, and uh, uh, did uh, work for us in uh, washing clothes and and keeping Yao from Japan, any Japanese threats and um, uh, and carrying the, the, the set of uh, radios originally we used were uh, took about 12 natives to carry the gear. But later on, when I was in enemy occupied territory in, in the Gazelle Peninsula area, I had a, just a little ATRA 4A which was a battery driven, which one person could carry. But then I needed a, a native to scramble up a tree. I'd practically walk up there and put my aerial up and so forth. So that was such an essential part, um, as I mentioned before, without the natives uh, in these parties, there just wouldn't have been uh, coast watches. They were Fantastic. wonderful heroes. Well, you kind of, started talking about it and I, i'd really like to get into that so what were the like main components that made a coast watching team 
Yeah, just touching briefly on what I said, but expanding a little bit. Um, we had a, uh, a an expat, which is one of those early uh, people that lived up in New, New Guinea and obviously knew um, Pigeon English back back to front and and, uh, and had all the experience. They had uh, a radio operator, of which I was one uh, in uh, several uh, of my mi missions, which I can come back to later. And um, then we had the uh, the natives, that's three. And then later on, um, because the, um, the first independent company, which were, later became the commandos, were included in Lark Force, they... Um, because the Japs had taken all their officers to uh, on a pr separate prison ship to Japan, they were left uh, leader leaderless, and uh, uh, Eric Feld, who was the author and the administrator of the Coast Watchers, who was the one that wrote the book, the Coast Watchers, uh, he. Um, he uh, grabbed these people and they became the fourth, what I call the fourth element, the uh, the um, the survivors of the first independent company became the military aspect. Uh, they were just a, a group of guys who kind of got trapped uh, behind yeah, any there, lines there? or There were 253 independent commandos, or they were later called commandos, independent company that were included in the... Uh, contingent of 1500 that uh, went up as the as the Lark, Lark Force and um, 132 of them landed at, uh, uh, at KBN on New, on New Island and they were obviously uh, overrun by the 3000 Japs that landed there and took the bush and they escaped in a, a battered old uh, uh, yacht that they were repaired. They were on their way down to Australia or Moresby to escape, but a Japanese uh, sp spot plane found them and, uh, uh, and esc they were escorted back. And 132 of them were on the uh, Montevideo Maroon that went, went down. Now, the balance of uh, 136 or about the other half were, um, uh, as I say, after the officers had been taken separately. They were left leaderless and and um, uh, Eric Phil picked them up as a fourth element to add the military strength to the parties. And they did a wonderful job. Uh, I, I don't know, there's a separate article in there, but uh, they, they finished up with about uh, oh, 30, 20 or 30 of them winning medals from the mostly Americans. The Aussie didn't like to give medals, but the, the Americans gave plenty of medals. <laughs> so, um, uh, but th they were well, well, well deserved. And uh, so uh, th they were the, what I call the fourth component here. Well, this particular uh, project that I'm doing, I'm focusing on the importance of communication on the battlefield. And I guess that's the other component, which was you as the signaler, the guy who operated the radio. I mean, that was your bread and butter. Could you talk a little bit about that role? Yeah, normally um, I was in forward bases uh, uh, supporting parties that are deeper into enemy territory. Uh, firstly, at NADSA, which was a mighty big uh, American air, air base. Then um, I spent six months at, at Medang. I had spent some time at Milne Bay as well. Then spent six months at, at Medang uh, with uh, one of the coast watchers, uh, Kirk or Smith. And then um, flew uh, by Mar American Mariner over to New Britain, joined another party, Fairfax Ross, where we were moving up uh, ahead of the Australian troops to ascertain the existence or the the where the where the japs were etc and then finally uh i went up to uh, into the uh, mount uh, gazelle mountains and spent 10 months with uh, 
uh, Malcolm English and uh, one of the other lieutenants, uh, Joe, Joe Willis, and I was the, the uh, operator. Now we had, um, uh, we, were, we were the only white people uh, from the land that saw Japanese uh, uh, rebel under Japanese occupation. So um, we would uh, trek to uh, uh, where we got better views and uh, giving signals of um, planes moving down, Japanese planes leaving Rabaul to uh, bomb Port Moresby and uh, Guada Guadalcanal. Uh, similarly, the so we had two skids uh, schedules schedules the short work schedules that we used um, at uh, I think twice a day uh, to um, headquarters and other other, other uh, parties and um, also the um, the case watches that were in Bougainville and Booker uh, Vila Salagi and and uh, down into down into Guadalcanal with one of the uh, main ones, a chap named Martin Clements, who did a did a wonderful job. Um, but that they um, with the Air Force war warnings and they were used uh, PL or plain language uh, to, to save time where where necessary to give the Americans time to uh, have their military uh, infantry ready, their planes up in the air ready to swoop, uh, uh, the, the uh, troops on the ships in general quarters ready to repel any, any attacks and um, they literally um, uh, shot down hundreds of pilots, uh, caused much damage to heaven knows how many uh, planes, etc., and um, other damage, and also uh, uh, obviously the, uh, those warnings that have saved hundreds of uh, lives of the of the Allies because they were in a more defensive mode, mode when when the Japs land, landed uh, were attacking by bombers. Now you really were the eyes and ears of the Allied forces in the Pacific. Exactly. That was the, yeah, you probably hit, a, hit the nutshell there, the eyes of the, haven't heard that word expression, but that's exactly what we were. And um, if you stop and work it out, uh, that, that, oh, gee, well, it makes me feel important because I was, <laughs> I was one of them. But, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, as part of uh, these, the signal that was there. Uh, yep. We, yeah, we had the eyes and ears. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it, it was one of the uh, uh, independent company blokes, Jack Mackey, uh, uh, Jack, yeah, Mackey, who uh, reported the uh, the flotilla that had left um, Rabaul and were going down to to invade Port Moresby uh, in a place called Kavala. Uh, uh, Harbour and another uh, case watcher Kennedy that they reported that and that's what brought about the uh, precursor to the Pacific War where they uh, the Americans had patched up their ships or well, most of them uh, from Pearl Harbour and sailed out to uh, into the Townsville area so nine Ships, including two Australian cruisers, uh, went out and built the bum, oh, built the ass off the uh, Japanese, and sent them scuttling back to uh, rebel. And um, honestly, uh, if if they'd just gone on to Moresby, they would have done exactly what they did at Moresby, which was only the front door step to uh, to Australia for invasion. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, a little bit so while there's back. My eyes, and there's my ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and, I must and remember go, that one. Uh, oh, definitely. I have to ask if we could take it back a little bit. And I would just like to know, how was it 
living in those conditions. I mean, I understand that the Pacific living out there in the Pacific, you know, out in the field, uh, limited resources must have been extremely tough. I mean, how do you keep a radio operating, let alone, you know, manage just to survive in that environment? Well, I'll be honest. Back in those days, there's was only 18, there's high adventure, let's get up into it. Two brothers were already up there, and I couldn't get up there fast enough. People have uh, sometimes asked me, uh, we are scared, what have you, you know, in Japanese territory, 100,000 of them, but the lazy bastards, they weren't moving around, they weren't picking up uh, uh, radio detection or watching our food drop from... Uh, lovely Catalinas or uh, Liberators to uh, keep us alive, mainly with mainly with 90% rice so we could feed the, feed the natives as well as, well as, as, well as ourselves. So, uh, so uh, that, that uh, uh, was what it was all about. And um, so getting back to the point here, I have been asked, uh, were you scared of something? Not for one minute. I got the old. I had the old adage that um, nothing's going to happen to me. It might happen to the other bloke, but not me. Uh, until it does, of course, and then then you're in trouble. <laughs> but um, uh, I've always believed in that, and uh, uh, n never for one minute was I scared or anything like that. Did you ever have issue with the radio breaking down and you said, <laughs> "Okay, how do we find parts well, or or anything like that?" Oh boy, you you're asking the nice touchy questions because the answer is yes. Uh, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but when we first learnt Morse code at the RMIT in Melbourne, uh, walking from Camp Pell into town in the first six weeks I was in the army, and there's a story to that too, but um, we, we learnt we Morse code. Now, getting back to your point, at one stage, uh, in, uh, in New Britain, in, in, Japan, in Japanese territory, uh, the bloody, <laughs> certainly the bloody, uh, the, the uh, radio wouldn't work. So um, I, uh, I, it was a sunny day. Uh, I took it out of its uh, box, and there is somewhere in my website about it. Uh, photo of it, took it out of its shell, turned it upside down, and all I could see is valves and resistors and conductors and that that I knew by name, but didn't have a clue. In that six weeks learning Morse code, not one moment did we learn how the, how the bloody operate the radio works. So um, uh, just to finish that story, uh, uh, and <laughs> you. You wouldn't believe this too. Uh, I had a, a lunch, a brown lunch paper bag of spare parts in a, in a somewhere, and uh, I took them out and I looked at all these blue things and green things and orange things with little wires coming down, and I'd um, I'd pick one up and say, "Oh, that looks like there, and that one looks like there." And, and eventually, I had the radio turned on, obviously, but it was, wasn't working. And then I got a signal. And from that day to this, I don't know how. I didn't use my teeth. <laughs> I didn't have a ra I didn't have a wireless, or I didn't have a soldering line or anything like that. But somehow I shorted it, and uh, bingo, I got a got a message, and I was back in business. So, in, in answer to your question, uh, technically. Uh, we were absolutely hopeless, uh, hopelessly prepared for it. But um, uh, a, a lot of our case watchers were uh, savvy with their with their uh, equipment. So, but I certainly wasn't. Well, it sounded like you you figured it out pretty quick, though. Yeah. yeah well, well, when you gotta gotta do something, you gotta gotta find your way out of it. <laughs> Because we would have been nude. We would have been of right. no use. Well, uh, we would have somehow got a, another native or one of the natives or two to go to another party and, and get a signal out to uh, uh, 
uh, seem to, to, to drop another radio set with some instructions in brackets <laughs> and there they work. Right, right. So how long were you um, part of this coast washing mission or how long did the coast washers operate? Well, I operated for the whole, uh, um, the whole war number two. Uh, and so that that's from um, uh, December 41 to 45. Uh, uh, I spent two and a half years with the Coast Watchers, having done that early work with the uh, range of uh, uh, messages up to New Guinea and another forward bases here. The, um, it was interesting, the, the bird, the bird forces, this is the origin of Lark, um, of the independent companies, um, one of them went to uh, Timor, which was the Sparrow Force, one went to Ambon, which was the Gull Force, and the ones that went to La, um, rebel were were Lark Force, and they were called the Bird Watchers, which were part of the Malay uh, barrier. The poor buggers that uh, went to the independent companies got cop got caught in in Rebe in Ambon, but three hundred of them decapitated by wow. the Japs. Wow. But anyway, uh, our, my story, is, of course, is all about Lark Force. I've got to comb my hair, see if my hair's done. I've seen it. I'm 98 now, and uh, I've still got a hair on my head. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and here's, my, here's my lovely wife that uh, was in the uh, Air Force. Oh, where, where can I get it? There it is there. She was in the Air Force for, for three years. And here she is now, still in love with her after 70, 70 years. She's a hot sword, isn't she? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Did you meet and, when you uh, were, we've got, uh, when you were got a coast watcher? Or? Sorry? Did you two meet while you were a coast watcher? Or? No, 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 no. Um, after the war, uh, for five years, uh, uh, I went back to normal life in, you know, chartered accountant's office and et cetera, but I met up with Beryl and uh, for five years uh, or so before we met and married. And we, were, we were both married at 27, so we were late marriages in those days. People used to get married by 20 or 21 or something, but uh, so uh, that was five, five years. Well and surely after the war and, Beryl was in record. She might have even recorded uh, my twin brother, Tom, who was in the Air Force, but uh, she wouldn't have known at the time. Yeah. Well, so far, uh, pretty much, I think we've hit everything. Um, we talked about the importance of the Coast Watchers. Um, some other quick little bits is while you were operating uh, over there, um, were you issued a type of uniform, or what sort of equipment were you issued? Oh, just just um, just ordinary khaki shirt and and uh, and shorts and long pants. Uh, no no um, uh, gongs or whatever. Uh, nothing to uh, show who's an officer and who's not. Um, uh, in the field, we were all the same. Uh, whilst the expats were uh, more important people, uh, so, uh, you know, captains and lieutenants and generals and heaven knows what, uh, in the um, parties, because we were all the same, it was all Tom, Dick and Harry. And you know, my my blokes were Malcolm and uh, and Joe and I was Jim. And uh, we were all, all on equal uh, levels because uh, we're all in the same stage of, uh, of risk, if you like to call it. So um, uh, that, that uh, uh, 
that was that was all. I I was lucky. I uh, never had. I think I might have had half malaria for half a day, but uh, that's about it. So I was extremely extremely lucky. Mm. Uh, health wise. Well, fantastic, fantastic. I think we covered most of everything. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come talk to me about this. Oh, well, thanks. I've always enjoyed uh, reminiscing of the of the past uh, in my uh, declining years. <laughs> a few years ago, my son and uh, also a friend were saying, why don't you write a book? I said, I wouldn't know how to fill a bloody book, but uh, I was convinced to uh, do a website, and now I've got about 40 stories uh, in there, and each one are, uh, uh, I hope to be readable on on their own. Um, so there's sometimes some du duplication, but um, the beauty about a book now is, um, uh, you, once you've put out a book, that's it. But now with the website, I've had uh, people like yourself. I've done a podcast from uh, London, another one from a couple from Sydney, and another one from Navy. And uh, my main mission in life now is to uh, let all Aussies uh, and the world know, for that matter, of how the Aussie Coast Watchers uh, saved the Pacific War. And when you stop and think about it, by doing that, uh, they were able to release Douglas MacArthur, who was then gone into the Northern Hemisphere. And he'd gone from uh, Lay. Uh, Finch Harbin, Sador, Madang, Ida B, uh, Biak, uh, Hollandia, and then on through the Philippines and to to, um, uh, to the Tinian Island and Iwo Jima, etc. So, in some respect, uh, uh, I like to think that uh, the Coast Watchers were the start of, uh, of winning the total war, let alone the Pacific War. <laughs> Absolutely, I would say so as well. As the eyes was, and ears, uh, and, that's and it. was Zed special got all the uh, publicity, if you like, uh, and, and yeah, they well deserved it. And the first one when they sunk forty thousand tons of shipping, but uh, they could have been wiped out by uh, any b b bombers, and uh, and and of course their uh, their later one was an abject failure with the whole twenty five, including ten of them beheaded but um but uh, the coast watchers actually uh did contribute enormously uh, in saving the uh, uh world war ii against japan well um as you've mentioned it wasn't without high cost there were a lot of guys that got hurt or didn't make it back as coast watchers correct yeah um, you know, and uh, another thing is, um, uh, I guess we wouldn't even have our president John F. Kennedy if it wasn't for the Coast Watchers, right? No, well, uh, his uh, PT 109 was bisected by a Japanese uh, crew, a warship in the middle of the night, and uh, after harrowing time with uh, about 11 survivors swimming to and fro little islands. There were two of our lovely uh, uh, Coast Watch natives. This is another plus for them. Uh, located them. Uh, they couldn't even, uh, they were all starving because they couldn't even open a coconut. But uh, Kennedy wrote that message on a coconut. And Reg Evans, uh, one of the Coast Watchers, saved uh, JFK, who became, the, of course, the prime, uh, the the president of America, yeah, and there was a there was a story about that a separate uh, movie. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I I don't want to take more of your time. I know you've got plans for the day. I really appreciate you coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Paul. <laughs>